name is Kenny Collier and I'm the Associate Pastor here at Spirit of Life Church and I want to thank you and welcome you uh, for this week's edition of Empowered Living. A few weeks ago we started a series on healing, how Jesus ministered healing and how those who were healed received that healing. We started with a man who was full of leprosy. He came asking the question to Jesus, if it be thy will. And Jesus praised the Lord, revealing the perfect will of God. And all that he said and all that he did, Jesus said, I will. And that man is no different than you and I today. Faith is the same then as it is now. And Jesus, our Father in heaven, they both are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Knowing he's not a respecter of persons, we know it's God's will for healing today. And I believe it's his will for all to be healed. And that none should perish. Both of these truths. Now, is it true that some still perish and some still aren't healed? Yes. But does it mean that it's his will for that to happen? In week number two, we took a look at Peter's mother-in-law. In Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus rebuked the fever. And we saw Jesus doing this several different times. He also spoke to the wind and the waves. He spoke to a tree. But it gives us a, a, a glimpse of the power of our words and our authority over those things that are put under the feet of Jesus. Because us, as seated with Jesus in heavenly places, according to Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2, we are above those things too. In the power of our words, life and death. And we are to be speaking life. And we can rebuke fevers and they must obey. We can rebuke tumors. We can rebuke acne. We can rebuke these things that are of the devil that are oppressing us. It says that Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Well, Jesus did it as a man, not as God, as a man full of the Holy Spirit, just as you and I are to do today. In week number three, we took a look at the man who was let down through the roof, brought in by his four friends. And Jesus seeing their faith. We talked about how in all these instances that we're going to be talking about of healing, where it's an individual case, not when Jesus healed the multitudes and masses, but when he healed individually someone then we know a little bit more about the relationship that in more than half of the cases the person's faith was the direct reason and the result of the healing he said he saw their faith in other verses he says according to your faith he says as you believed you have received as you believed let it be done unto you you know, your faith has made you whole. So we saw the importance of faith when we come before the Lord. Desperation doesn't move the Lord Jesus. Desperation doesn't move our God and Father. But it is faith that pleases Him. And it is impossible to please Him without faith. We also saw that Jesus spoke to the man who was let down to the roof and said, Your sins be forgiven thee. We have to be clear right now. Get free of shame. Get free of guilt. Knowing that as a child of God, we are worthy for all that He has for us. That includes healing. It is wrong thinking to think that you've done too much or sinned too badly. That yes, you're saved, but if I don't get healed, it's okay because I know I've done bad things. That's wrong. Get that out of your mind. That's a lie from the enemy. Healing is a part of the same redemptive work of Jesus Christ. His shed blood, his hanging on the cross, his death and resurrection, as is the forgiveness of sins and salvation. This week I want to talk to you about the case of the healing of the nobleman's son. Now we believe these aren't just stories, but these are truths, these are history, these are facts that occurred. As Jesus really walked the earth, there was really a nobleman whose son was lying at home dead. I'm reading out of John chapter 4, verse 46 through 54. It says, Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he made the water to wine. This is the place where he had his first miracle. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea to Galilee, he went unto him. This already is an instance that we need to understand for healing. Humility is such a key part of healing. This was a nobleman. Jesus was the son of a carpenter. Usually he would send his servants to Jesus and tell him, Hey, nobleman needs you. Come to my house. And they would expect him to be there. And this isn't the first time we see this instance. Back in 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman one of great authority, had wealth, went to see the man of God at his house because he was full of leprosy. And he said, man of God, come down and, and heal me. I believe your God is true. I believe that you can heal me. He was expecting some great sign, some great wonder from heaven, expecting the man of God to lay his hands on him. But the man of God instead sent his servant to Naaman and said, go wash in the Jordan seven times. Well, this made Naaman very upset. He was angry and he started riding home on his chariot, fuming that the man of God wouldn't even leave his house to visit him in person after he went all this way and honored him to come to his place of residence. Well, Naaman had to humble himself and receive that word from the servant and go wash himself in the Jordan seven times and his leprosy was gone. It's the same thing here. The nobleman is humbling himself and instead of bidding Jesus to come to his house, he went to Jesus. 
But as we will see, he still had it in his mind how he would heal his son. He had in his mind that Jesus had to come to his house and lay his hands upon his son in order for him to be healed. Be careful of this. Be careful of you dictating how God needs to heal you or meet your needs. I was guilty of this. I was dealing with some back issues and some pain. And I thought once I got done with my master's degree and studying it out and, and I proved faithful and still finishing my master's, that all that pain would be gone. Well, that wasn't. And I got angry with God. And I was like, what else do I have to do for you, Lord God? I did this. I was faithful. I drove three hours. I did this. Why am I still dealing with this pain? Well, I had nothing to do with God's healing in my life. Nothing whatsoever. But what does is faith. What does is faith. That's what we need to come to the Lord with. It's impossible to please God without faith. We come to the Lord with faith. We don't come begging. We don't come in desperation. We come in faith. You know, a lot of people say, well, I have to see it to believe it. That's not how we as Christians walk. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The psalmist in chapter 27 says, I would have fainted unless I believed I would see. And in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it says, What so things you desire when you pray? Believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. When do we have them? After after we believe that we shall receive them. we got to stand praying in the prayer of faith, not begging, not in desperation. I know it's hard because we get to that point where we're hurting and we have pain and, and we have feelings and all this angst around us, but we have to stand firm on God's word. Let's continue reading. We'll see that in, in this uh, instance of healing. In verse 47, the nobleman besought Jesus that he'd come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, we know the nobleman's heart wasn't exactly right, because Jesus says this in verse 48, Except you see a sign and a wonder, you will not believe. That's where most of us are today. We want to see it first to believe it. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Believe that you receive, then you shall have, then you shall see, then you shall feel them. But we have to stand praying and believing his word first. Verse 49, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, please, please, he's begging him, lest my child die. So he still doesn't have it yet. Jesus said, I'm not going to show you a sign of wonder. But he's still begging for a sign of wonder right there. But instead, what does Jesus do in verse 49? I'm sorry, verse 50. Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. Jesus spoke the word. Now the nobleman has a decision to make. The word has been spoken. You see, when we, this is in the very pl same place that he, he did his first miracle, water to wine. And Jesus' mother Mary said, whatever he says, do it. Well, that still applies today. Whatever the Lord Jesus says to you, we need to obey. We need to do it. This is how miracles happen. It's by obedience and through faith and by the grace of Lord Jesus. Absolutely. But get a hold of this. He said, go your way, your son, he lives. The nobleman had a decision to make. He could continue sitting right there and begging Jesus to come down, or he could grab a hold of the Word of God, grab a hold of it in his heart, believe the Word of God, and obey the Word of God. The nobleman went his way, so he made the right decision. He says, and the man believed the Word, the man's faith. He believed the Word, and he went his way. This is the same way that still works today. He went his way. Now you got to understand, he, he came from a far distance. So now that he has the word of God, now that he has the words of Jesus, it's not over. He still has to stand on that word. He still has to act on that word. He still has to speak that word. Let's say it was a 15 mile walk home. That whole 15 miles that he's walking home, he's got feelings that he's dealing with. He's got fearful thoughts. Well, maybe it wasn't true. Maybe uh, I left. Maybe I should have just grabbed him and taken him by force. I really thought I needed Jesus to come here. All these thoughts are attacking him. He had to cast down these imaginations and he had to walk it out in faith. And then let's continue reading. It says, And as he was now going, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Verse 52. Then inquired the nobleman and said, What hour did the son start to get better? And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Yesterday, the man had to walk. This was a new day. He had to spend the night dealing with the thoughts, dealing with doubt or unbelief. No, he had to stand upon the word of God that was given him. Go your way, your son lives. Verse 53. So the father knew that it was at the same hour that Jesus spoke 
the word of God, thy son lives, that his son was healed. That's the way it is for us today. We need to understand that when we've been given the word of God, we've got to get that word of God. We've got to grab a hold of it as we believed, we have received, plant it in our hearts, and water that word with his spirit. Water that word with his word daily and, and walk, not by sight, but by faith. Let me pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to hear your word. And Lord God, I just pray in our hearts that we would grab a hold of the word, your words that you've spoken to us, that we wouldn't continue begging for something that we know that you've given us, but that you, by your grace, Jesus, you would help us to stand, to stand on your word that says you've healed us, to stand on your word that says you've made us free, that you've forgiven us, that you've given us your peace that you've given us joy, that you love us, Lord God. To stand on your word, to believe and not doubt, and to walk according to your word, regardless of how we feel, all the days of our life, Father God. I just ask for your grace, God, upon all those who are watching, to continue to strengthen us, to believe and to stand in your word by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.